Uh, Carl Weatherall, Executive Director, CEO of Canada Mining Innovation Council. I've been on the ground just over two years, and Alan, I'm not from the mining industry either. So I, I've been in non-profit, for-profit government space, primarily in the research, innovation, commercialization space across different sectors. And I guess the hallmark of what I've been doing is consortium in things like microelectronic software, cybersecurity, e-commerce, astroparticle physics, all sorts of stuff. So I'm trying to bring all of that together here and confuse everybody. So <laughs> I'm going to be talking about business ecosystems as a potential way that we can get out of this whole innovation conundrum that we have because we've got a bit of a mess. We talk about this word all the time, right? Like we use it here, it's in our titles, it's in our companies, it's in our boardrooms, it's everywhere, but do we really know what it means? Everybody in this room knows what it, knows what it means, right? Because if you search the New World Dictionary called Google, you get 125 million definitions of innovation. If I stuck a definition of innovation up there, I can guarantee you that everybody in this room would want to change it, tweak it a little bit because everybody has their own spin on what it is. So we're really confused about what innovation actually is. Not just the mining industry, everybody in general. But of course, we like to make things really, really complicated and try and decide what type of innovation are we actually doing. Are we doing step change innovation or disruptive innovation or market innovation or business model innovation? Are we doing McEwen mining innovation? And we've got 356 million different types of innovation. And if you look at any of these web pages, it's 10 types of innovation, 15 types of innovations, Carl's 35 types of innovation. So it's really complicated. You love this stuff if you're doing finite element analysis or computer, uh, um, computational fluid dynamics because you have m massive, massive matrices to play with. If you're an executive in the company, you're going, oh my God, what am I doing here? This is absolutely nuts. So, it's really confusing, but is it working for our industry? This data is from, some of you have seen this from Robbie Stansel from B VCI. It's not publicly available. He's provided this with the Canadian extract. And essentially what this shows is from a survey of several hundred executives in the mining industry and the service industry is that innovation programs are failing. Over 80% of executives in Canada have said their innovation programs are delivering below expectations. In other words, they're failing. That's pretty bad, but you know, what is the model? You know, we talked, I just mentioned what the model is that's failing, but what is it? 90% of executives in the Canadian mining industry, the model for innovation is ad hoc. So does the ad hoc model work? No, it doesn't. They're failing. And a lot of that resides around um, what we understand innovation to be or how we do it. But also centers around how we fund it and how much we fund it. Everybody loves comparing ourselves to Australia, right? They're the, they're the peoples like Apple and Google or Apple and Microsoft. And if you correct this for GDP, Australia, and this is both government and private sector investments, are three to five times more investment in innovation, not research, and in innovation, because those two are not the same thing, than in Canada. And, you, and we wonder why they're getting ahead of us and doing so well and why we're trying to compare ourselves to them. So it's very obviously obvious that the innovation system in Canada for the mining industry doesn't work. It's broken. There's a nice visual here to try and prove that. Or, since we're in Toronto on Bay Street, we have to stop this madness, right? We've got to find some way to correct the innovation system because it doesn't work. And if you talk to companies that we consider to be exceptionally innovative, like a Google or like an Apple, do they have a step change innovation program? Or do they have an incremental innovation program? Or are they relentless on the core focus and core values of the company and what they're trying to do. So Google, for example, focuses on two things. They don't focus on step change innovation. They focus on exceptional user experience, number one, and number two, search. That's it. They don't, they don't focus on innovation. Same as Apple, they don't focus on innovation. They focus on the business. They look at the business. So if we take the innovation thing and turn it around and say, instead of talking about step change innovation, what if we talk about the business? So let's take a look at some of the major issues that the business of mining is, is, uh, is facing right now. And you can couple these, a lot of stuff under here. So if you look at productivity, for example, you could say the, the challenge with exploration, you know, we'd stick a lot of money in exploration, we're not finding new deposits. That's essentially a productivity issue. Underground mining, productivity underground is what, 20%. We spend more time shoveling people and empty trucks back and forth, forth than we do actually extracting value underground. Energy, well, all in sustaining costs, 35, up to 35% are energy. Combination efficiency is, what, 5%? Hasn't changed in 50 years. There's some big challenges there. License to operate, tailings water management. 
you know, that last slide I just showed, there's a big challenge with, with uh, license to operate and, that, and the tailings and water issue is actually generating a lot of challenges in communities. And if you look at the business, pro, or the business pieces of this, there are direct impacts in all these to OPEX, CAPEX. Can we find new mines? The mines that we have operating or that we're trying to get up and going, are they viable? Can we make a non-operating uh, non or a non-viable asset viable? And of course, if you look at these things from, a, from an industry perspective, nobody in this room can solve any of those themselves at that scale. Is anybody here going to tackle the combination efficiency thing and drive it from 5 to 50%? No. How about productivity underground? Can you go from 20% to 80% on your own without investing billions in cash? And are you going to want to do that? No. So how do we get over that? We've got to do something this industry doesn't do very well, at least not as well as other industries, is collaborate. There's a lot of really smart people in the mining industry. If we get a lot of these really smart people together in a room and with some really cool ideas, neat ideas, we can come up with some different things on changing the business and tackling those, the, the elements of those three big problems like finding new deposits and, and challenging the, the model for underground mining. Now I'm going to give you, and this is, this is the essence of open innovation right here. I'm not going to talk about open innovation, you've heard about it, but I'm going to give you an example and how that leads into the business ecosystem perspective. So I don't know if you're, you're familiar with this, the uh, Henry Chesbro diagram on uh, open innovation. Essentially everything inside the funnel is the mining industry, everything outside is other industry. And along the bottom, the big piece of the funnel is essentially research or the TRL zero and technology readiness level zero. And now the, on the other end is systems ready to be deployed. So that's essentially how it works. So what one of our technical groups has defined is basically we want to figure out how to do real-time water quality monitoring. We're going to have to develop a, a package, a sensor package to do that because it doesn't exist anywhere in the world in any industry, let alone mining. If you look at the sensors that are available right now for water quality monitoring the mining industry, they're on selective electrodes. And when I was on the bench as a chemist 20 years ago, 30 years, oh, 10 years ago, um, they didn't work then. They certainly don't work now. So where are, the, where are these solutions going to come from? It's very simple. We've already looked around and identified some companies and technology in areas like photonics. Genomics, there's a really neat startup company in Calgary that is looking at putting uh, biological material on a chip to monitor 4,000 different things in water. Like, that's really cool stuff. He's actually changed his business plan after talking to us and being introduced to some companies. Some, some of the companies are in this room. Microelectronics, that's not an issue. They've been packaging microelectronics, doing low voltage, low power, and all sorts of things, system on chip, uh, calculations on chip, also uh, processing on chip. There's some really neat things going on now. There's a group in Waterloo looking at um, XRF on a chip. So this whole microelectronics industry, there's a lot of stuff we can bring in from that in industry. And again, nanotechnology, microfluidics. The really cool example that directly ties into Allen is there's a startup company in uh, Waterloo that's using quantum encryption to basically extend a depth of penetration of the um, analysis technique in, in boreholes just by manipulating the data. So there's a lot of stuff that can be brought to bear there. And this is usually what you hear about the open innovation thing, what goes in. But what is missing almost all the time is on the outside, on the flip side, on the other side once you get this technology platform built. And that's essentially what happens. By using this approach, you, you end up developing new technology platforms. And when you do that, you gen generate new value, market disruption, new partnerships, potentially new companies, new applications, all sorts of things. It's a total, total uh, paradigm shift in your existing market and new markets. So if you just think about this water quality sensor package, where else can you grab that and apply it? You could apply it in a lot of places. You could apply it in municipal. You could apply it in, in ocean monitoring. You could potentially, some really smart entrepreneur could take that package and um, simplify it and, and uh, reduce it to the point where you could actually buy it in, in, in a Walmart. They do water quality testing, checking for Giardia. So it's a platform approach that has a massive impact everywhere else. So this is really cool to talk about all this stuff. And you know, we talk about innovation, prophesize about innovation, but how do we do this? And of course, being a number of engineers in the room, this is probably quite appealing, right? <laughs> and that's where the business ecosystems come into play. Now, a business ecosystem, and I know people despise the term ecosystem because it's abused as much, if not more, than innovation. But a business ecosystem is a constructed entity to drive market disruption and massive value. It's a constructed organization. It's not a word. It's not a, it's not a McEwen mining ecosystem in this room. It's a constructed business. 
with the sole purpose of harnessing innovation across the globe to drive change and produce lots of value. So I've got a couple of slides here that are basically um, boring definitions, but it, it's trying to get people to understand how does this work and what is it? What are the components of these things? And there's a lot of different, if you, if you look up business ecosystems and, and diagrams of what it looks like, there's a lot of really complicated ones. And Tony Belletti from Carlton has actually got one of the simplest and beautiful descriptions of business, business ecosystems. So let's start with the platform. I talked about that a little bit already, but basically it's, it's, it's a building block. As I said, it's a platform for, on which you can build other things and create new markets, new value, new companies, et cetera. It's complementary to everything. Everybody in the ecosystem is complementary to what you're doing and to other technology you already have in place. It's not something potentially that could totally displace and disrupt. An important piece here is it co-created. People are doing it together. It's not one company creating this and then selling it to the rest of the ecosystem. It's co-created by people getting together and providing assets or providing knowledge or providing money or IP or whatever. It's co-created. A really important thing too, going back to these BHAGs in the industry as it were, is it's typically challenging a big problem. It's challenging something nobody else can do on their own. So you coalesce around this single, I can't do it myself. But if we collectively get together, we can solve that and produce this new te technology. And I talked about the, the, uh, the value creation and, and market disruption and, and all sorts of other things as well. So that's basically the platform. And you know, it'd be nice to think about the sort of platforms we could have in, in this industry. A niche, nice little terms. I used to work with a lot of entrepreneurs and <laughs> niche is a nice word a lot of them use. Essentially, it's just a group of people in getting together that are trying to address a specific need, a specific identified need. It's not a loose collection of people trying to do cool stuff. It should be cool stuff, but it's a specified need to create products and create platforms and advance that platform. They create uh, value, and this is a really important piece at the niche level and the member level. It creates value to everybody. Everybody creates value. There's co-creation of value here. It's not one dominant organization creating all of the value. Everybody's co-creating value. That's the, that's the whole concept be behind ecosystems. And of course, it, everything contributes to the platform technology that you're looking at. I'll give you examples of, of, of ecosystem, business ecosystems as well. And the keystone. Keystone, if anybody knows architecture, you know, the keystone block in, in the old-fashioned buildings in the arches, it alludes to the same sort of thing. This is a very key point. They're typically small relative to the rest of the ecosystem, business ecosystem, but have massive, massive impact. And I'll give you two examples of that, uh, ecosystems I know. Decrease cost, increase trust, and help basically uh, reduce barrier to uh, market entry, all sorts of things. But it's, a, it, it's basically the conductor and the coordinator of, of the flow of information, people, and assets within the, in the business ecosystem. The, the most important point is small, big impact. Excuse me, Carl, is yes. there a model that the industry can use? I'm, <laughs> we're getting there. So we're I'm just wondering without the definitions, if, if we can, there's something we can adopt. We're, we're getting there. Thank you for that. Nice segue. <laughs> And again, the members. Again, these could be typically in software business, these are individuals, but in a business like this and in hardware, they're typically organizations. So people, organizations come in and help put all sorts of creativity, assets, IP, whatever, uh, into, the, into the business ecosystem. It covers the entire supply chain. It's not just mining companies, it's not just mining suppliers, it's a supply chain within and outside of the typical business. And that's a very important piece, especially in our industry because we have to bring some uh, assets from outside People, I mentioned that before, people have different roles within the, members have different roles within the ecosystem, whether it's commercializing, whether it's providing funding or IP or assets or platforms or, or space or whatever. And again, investments are aligned. There's a lot of focus and alignment on what you're doing versus uh, the, the comment we had at a meeting a few weeks ago is we have 50 people knocking on our door to do all different things. This focus, an, an ecosystem approach focuses investment, resources, time, money and also what you're trying to do. It focuses on objectives, business objectives. And, and, and again, um, the, the whole point of the membership is to make sure this e ecosystem is like a real ecosystem. It thrives and grows and waxes and wanes and things change as necessary, not a fixed entity with fixed borders. And in, it, it's interesting, some of the uh, existing ecosystems and previous ones, they have a phenomenon called uh, dominant player. 
And these are typically large companies putting in significant amount of money of their own in their own companies and trying to take as much as they can with respect to IP, not playing well with everybody, and they eventually disappear. You know, IBM in the PC market is a really good example of that. Microsoft and Intel got together and, and turned that into a software play. And IBM got squeezed out. And can you think of anybody in the mining industry that resembles that? I won't say who it is, but I, you can probably guess who that is. Change. It drives change. It just, change happens. It creates the change because of the way you're working together and what you're doing. And uh, a big thing too is adoption of technology is a really tough thing in the mining industry. It's a really hard thing to do. This simplifies it because you're all working together. You're seeing how it works. Um, and, uh, and it's tested. It's typically tested. A couple of examples, and this isn't hard and fixed because even Google, uh, let's go through this and I'll give you a couple of um, further breakdown of this. So you have open and closed. Closed are typically vendor led. Microsoft operates a business ecosystem. They, they use a business ecosystem approach. So does Apple. Ely Cafe, the same thing. If you can produce coffee using a business ecosystem approach, I think we can use, do the same thing. Uh, there's no name for this one, but there's a group of 11, I think it's now 15 uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, where IP is, is a really nasty thing. It's, it's really contentious. They're getting together to solve a protein challenge that none of them is willing to spend 10 or 15 years. And once they create that, that process for whether it's either identifying or, or synthesizing that protein, they can all benefit from it. It's, the platform is a, is a molecule, platform technology. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have Google. Google isn't, you know, if you look at Android, that's completely open. That's a totally open platform. Now, they do have some closed pieces of their ecosystem, like their search algorithm. They're never going to give that up, nor the fine-tuned database they use. They're not going to give that up, but everything else is essentially open. And the same with Apple. Apple Store, that's an open piece. They, they don't make money off of this. Apple barely breaks even. But what it does is it gets people to funnel all of their resources and money to all of their, all of their products. Um, totally open, and again, we say community-led, is the Eclipse Foundation. It's based in Ottawa. Everybody here has used something that's, that is built on the Eclipse software package, whether it's a router, whether it's a, 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 some sort of hardware. If you use uh, BI tools that are developed by IBM, Oracle, SAS, they were built on the Eclipse platform. And when I talk about massive impact, small organization, this has seven people, $4 million budget. Their impact is billions, billions per year across the globe. Uh, Google, again, it's a large organization. The, the benefits they're, they're getting out of the being in the ecosystem is about $3 billion. The ecosystem in general is, is valued at 10 to 20 trillion. So again, small versus large. It's a larger picture people are looking at. And then the defense space, Alan, you may actually know Nightworks, Nightworks and RPDE. And, and the interesting piece is these are led by governments. Governments started these, but it's essentially to address issues in military and defense uh, technology. And because the, the key adopter and purchaser of these things is, mili is government, they're typically led by government. And there's 200, in, I think RPD, RPDE is up to 200. Nightworks, 150 different organizations. This is suppliers, defense contractors, government, academia as well. The interesting thing is I was part of a team about 10 years ago trying to build the Canadian equivalent of this called Accord, and it, we couldn't get it together. We couldn't get the players together. We were really close, but it didn't quite work. So Rob, to answer your question, what's a model? Now, I'm not saying this is the model, but I'll let you think about it. About seven years ago, a bunch of people got together and said, we've got these big challenges we have to deal with. We got eight people dealing with exploration and said, we can't find deposits fast enough. It's getting too, uh, they're too remote, undercover. We, it's like a product development curve. It's lengthening too fast. We have to get some folks together. What are we going to do? They built, eight people got together, built a 10-year technology roadmap. It's now 50 people. They're executing on the first five years. The leverage on the investment on that is 54 to 1 as a minimum, as a minimum. And then other people said, well, we've got, you know, tailings water man management's an issue. Let's collect some people around that and see what, how are we going to address this? What do we need to do to address this? We've got three feasibility studies out right now in project planning. One is on that center package. So, and, it, and these things grow and expand as necessary. And if you look at other pieces of those challenges and of the business, and some of these were retooling, <clears throat> the idea is to 
get the right people around the table to tackle those challenges and figure out how to get there and interact with each other. But also, interesting new emerging, emerging techniques or technologies come up, like genomics. We're actually working very closely with CIM and a number of other, other organizations across Canada to try and figure out, okay, what, what does that look like for the mining industry? What does the asset map look like? What is the, how can, they, how can that, those assets actually fit into and solve some of the challenges in the industry? Other, other uh, things that can happen in the business ecosystem, we used to have an HR group as well. It's gone. It do wasn't working. So we, 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 you stop. So these things wax and wane and grow and dissipate. This is two people. Small, big impact. And again, on the supply chain, I'm not trying to sell CMIC. This is a model. This is one example model. You could have a second ecosystem, mining e ecosystem that's put together. The collaboration model is across everything that we need. Academia, we're talking, we've sat and talked with some people at some banks, venture capitalists, SDTC, Scotiabank approached us and said, how can you help us reduce our risk of investment? So the whole, the whole, the ecosystem is truly an ecosystem. And of course, other different, uh, other different sectors, ICT, aerospace, yes, Rob. Can I interrupt you? Again? Absolutely. And this question on the expiration, you said it was 50 or to one return. How do you measure that? That's just the financial return on the project, the project investment. They were able to find deposits to generate a No, no, this is just, it's the first step of their, uh, of the roadmap and the project, again, this is just purely financial around that project. The first project is 13 million and people put in, one company will put in 250 million, 13 over 250, 54. But it's nothing about the success? Not yet, because it's only in the second year. It's just, it's just in the second year of success. That impact is coming. But don't you want to get to that point quickly? Uh, when you're trying to fundamentally change the industry, it's, it's difficult to do. You're, you're right, absolutely right. This is a 10-year return, not a one-year return, and that's part of the challenge. And that time frame that's too long? Um, let me ask you this. If you don't change that and take that risk over that time frame, what's going to happen if, if, if you do nothing on the expiration side? And that's what's happening. That's exactly what's happening right now. But the idea is to get to fundamentally changing how exploration is done in 10 years. And the same as on some of these other areas as well, is to fundamentally change how, how mining is done, continuous underground mining, changing the paradigm. It, it, it's hard to do, but what we're trying to do is build those measurable wins on an annual basis. When do you expect to get the measurable wins started? Uh, it depends on which project. That's a complicated question, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, so where was it? As I was saying, the the uh, basically covering the entire ecosystem of who can put in and take out. Um, it, what's an example? BHAG. What's an example? Target. What's an example? Challenge. You know, I mentioned productivity, energy, and environment. They're all challenges with respect to waste. Productivity waste, energy waste, and tailings and water are an issue. If you got rid of tailings, you'd no longer have water and tailings to deal with. Right? You, you get fundamentally get rid of the issue, and you get rid of the social license issue. So I'm gonna leave you with a question. So my apologies for this. Um, it's a little, little fuzzy, but basically Clayton Christensen came up and did some calculations and, and some theoretical ideas on and this kind of answers your question, Rob, on the payback of innovating versus doing nothing, the long-term payback. So if you're, um, if you're doing nothing, essentially, you're in trouble in the long term. You'll be in, if you do nothing, if you do nothing. If you innovate, there's going to be short-term hurts. It's going to cost to innovate. Over the long term, you actually have very significant value creation for your organization, for your company, for the industry.